Welcome to the Parented Podcast Series. Today we continue to talk ECCE. With us is Mr. Alec Delancey from the DAIU unit. Can you tell us what that acronym refers to? Uh, yes, Cheryl. Uh, it's the Developmental Assessment and Intervention Unit. That unit is a unit in the Ministry of Education, Student Support Services, and it is staffed with behavioral specialists, clinical psychologists, and school psychologists. Okay, so Alec, today we will be discussing strategies for managing hyperactivity, impulsivity in children, with a focus mm -hmm. on ECC children. Mm -hmm. So can you explain what is hyperactivity and impulsivity? Yes, uh, that's a good question, uh, Cheryl, because sometimes people mix it up. But uh, hyperactivity has to do more with the sort of behaviors associated with fidgeting or moving or getting up out of one seat and going somewhere else when they ought not to. And uh, impulsivity, that has to do with actually uh, a person simply thinking, okay, um, I need something and I'm going to get it. And not thinking overly about any kind of... Uh, uh, issue about it. So if, for example, an impulsive person sees your microphone there and they want it, they just get up and take it without even recognizing that this interview is going on. Okay, so how does discipline impact on this? Mm -hmm. How can parents um, decide, okay, well, my child is impulsive, mm -hmm. how can I discipline him? How does this work? Yeah, um, discipline is is critical, it's crucial. Um, when When Training any child, uh, how much more so a uh, young child who is showing impulsivity or hyperactivity. Mm -hmm. So you find that the parent may have to engage in a, in a number of, of strategies or, or techniques. So uh, a classical one has to do with timing. Now someone who is hyperactive, they may have a blindness to time. In other words, they may not recognize how quickly time is passing. So they get up. They're hyperactive. They're doing something else. In the case of the early childhood, uh, they will they have some coloring to do. They leave the coloring and they go and they may be tapping on the wall or they go and they talk to their friends. So how do you help that child? You may need a timer. So you will have to put that timer there and say, okay, notice what time it is. When this hand reach over on this number, you have to stop the task. And sometimes, let's say you give a, a child 15 minutes to do a task. You may actually have to, every five minutes, mm -hmm. say to that hyperactive or that impulsive child, five minutes pass. Are you getting the task done? Are you completing this assignment? After another five minutes, you might have to come back again. So it's really about not just keeping them accountable, but keeping a hyperactive or impulsive child more account accountable, even compared to the typical population. So can, we, can you tell me if we, we can find children who are both hyperactive and impulsive? You have the same traits? Yeah, definitely. Uh, while it's true that one trait may rate its head at a specific time during the child's development, it is possible for a child to be hyperactive so they may be the ones, as was mentioned, of the getting out of the seat. Mm -hmm. It's not time for the teacher to do any kind of work that requires them to stand, but they're standing. And that same child, during the same day, may actually see the snack of another child. And they have their own snack that their mommy or daddy give them, you know. But they go take out that snack from that child's bag and eat it. And eat it during class time, not even during recess. I mean, they shouldn't be taking anybody's snack. They have their own. So you can have that kind of hyperactivity and impulsivity in the same person and at the same time. In some situations, you may find a child being a little more hyperactive at one particular time in their life. And as they grow, you might actually see them being a little more impulsive. So you can have that change as well. Well, you know, I smile there just now because I have seen children in the classroom with those displaying those behaviors that you mm -hmm. just described. Mm -hmm. The child would go to the lunch kit, children's yeah. lunch kit, and just take the snack without even asking for it. Mm -hmm. So how can teachers deal with this? Yeah, um, rules are important. Now, we all talk about rules in the classroom, and a number of teachers, they will have their rules stick up somewhere. 
I often say to teachers, it's important you have the rules stuck up on the wall. Now, the rules can be not just words, sometimes pictures. Remember for those small those mm -hmm. little ones, maybe a picture of something they ought not to be doing and closely next to what they ought not to be doing, a picture of what they should be doing. So they have not just, Miss don't want me to, she don't want me to, um, or so doesn't want me to do this, but they actually have the correct behavior right next to it. But it doesn't end there. You also need consequences. Because after all, if the child still breaks the rule, you can't just make up the consequences as you go along. You have to have specific consequences, age-appropriate ones, that the child will have to experience if it is that they break the rule. So that's a, a, a way to help that child keep. So what factors do you think contribute to children being impulsive or hyperactive? Uh, there can be a number of factors. Research is, is ongoing, but some of the classical ones, for example, genetics, uh, hereditary, we have noticed, looking at the research uh, articles, research papers, that if a parent or a grandparent is showing traits associated with hyperactivity or impulsivity, now there's no specific gene that you can point to, but there are groups of genes when placed in a specific environment, when a person is placed in a specific environment, those genes can actually rear their heads and you can see that happening. So it could be passed down from generation to generation. But of course, there's also things like alcohol use during pregnancy, uh, drug use, and so forth. So those are some possibilities. How are we to get that information from parents too? Because you know, it's difficult. You speak to a parent and you tell this parent, okay, well, your child is very hyperactive in school. How can we get that information to, you know, to get, uh, let's say, intervention? How can mm -hmm. we get the information from parents? to know yeah. where this is coming from, whether it's genetic or whether, whether it was something that was caused during pregnancy. Right. Now, a number of the students that are referred to us, uh, we still have to ask the consent of the parents. So sometimes a parent may opt not to say exactly what their childbirth may have been like, whether or not they were using some substance, or the parent themselves might not even be aware of the genetic traits associated with hyperactivity. They may just cut it off as, well, my, all my brothers, they are just hyperactive and they involve in, in football and they, they, they track and feel and, and construction and they, they're doing fine. So they may not see those traits as anything that is problematic. So it could be a little difficult to talk to a parent and say, okay, um, where do you think this is coming from? So the best is to look at the environmental factors that may be contributing or triggering the specific behaviors that we are seeing in the children. Okay, and at this point in time, we are seeing a lot more children coming into the environment being hyperactive. Mm. And um, parents are saying that it's their diet. What do you think about this? Well, I mean, there's a lot of research out there about diet. Um, for example, they talk about uh, maybe dyes in, in, in the food and coloring and so forth. The research does not really point to that. Um, even sugars and so forth, it really, um, sh actually the research shows that glucose is necessary for, for proper brain development. Of course, there needs to be balance in diet, and uh, it's always good for a parent probably to talk to a dietitian or a pediatrician or someone who can help them to make sure that the child is getting the necessary nutrients. Thank you for that point. We now go to a short break. Before the break, we were talking about nutrition and hyperactivity. So can you give us some insight into that? Our parents, I know, would be very interested in this. Yes, um, Cheryl, definitely. 
once a child has a diagnosis, let's say, for example, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, that's what we call the ADHD, mm -hmm. uh, it is important that, one, the child receive a proper assessment for that diagnosis, but also to speak to, um, the parent should speak with a nutritionist, at least to help them where the, the diet uh, and nutrition is, is concerned. Okay, so in, in one of our episodes, we will have a, a nutritionist on board. Mm -hmm. So let's continue. We talked about genetics mm -hmm. a few minutes ago, and I want to discuss strategies for intervention now. How can um, teachers, parents assist their children with these um, hyperactivity, impulsivity disorder? There are a number of techniques and strategies that can be used. So, for example, a little while ago, we spoke about the timers. It's mm -hmm. so important to have that child on a timer. Now, think in terms, and this is what parents and teachers should think in terms of. A hyperactive or impulsive child is one who needs a good bit of attention. And in so saying, it means that the typical functioning child may not need some of the strategies that I'll talk about. So, for example, the, the, the timer could work for anybody, but it should be a prosthetic for that hyperactive or impulsive child. Keeping on time, because remember, there's a blindness we talk about the time. They're not recognizing how quickly a time is actually going. Another thing can be the rules and the consequences. Parents, teachers, I mean, teachers, they have it really nicely mapped out in their class rooms. And the same should really be done in the home, where a parent can actually have a corner where they have the rules and the consequences. Another thing, uh, punch cards. I see those punch cards used really beautifully. That is where you have the card, you have the child's name on it, you have the specific behavior that you want the child to accomplish, mm -hmm. and then you have a reward that the child will get at the end, and then you have maybe one to five. And uh, let's say every 15 minutes, if the child keeps on task or works towards achieving the ultimate goal, you put a little punch or a little hole there. And once they achieve all the five or six punches, then they will get the reward. I also noticed that this works really effectively. Uh, children like stars. They like ticks. So once you can create a form or a sheet, and these are some of the things you can actually pull off from the internet, uh, effective ones. You have the child's name, and every time they engage in a particular behavior that you want them to engage in, you give them a star. Okay. So what role does physical activity play in this? Should mm -hmm. teachers take the children outside more to engage in outdoor activities? Yeah, definitely. Uh, what I note is that in our society today, a lot of Times we, we sort of sit down and, and physical activity sometimes just take a back burner. But if you can have those young children engaging in physical activities, it helps with endorphins. It helps their brains to regulate better. It really helps even their, their, their muscles and their, their, their body to grow healthier. Uh, oxygenation of the blood and so forth. So it's really a, a good opportunity to help that child to self-regulate by taking them out in nature. Maybe they take a walk see a tree, identify the leaves, maybe touch the tree. Sometimes those are things that uh, are fleeting because they may have the handheld yeah. devices and, you know, they're inside a lot. And, of course, that could bring a whole host of physical and medical issues just by sitting and uh, how much more so psychological regulation once they're out in the environment. So are there any long-term, um, let's say, intervention strategies, you know, if this goes untreated, if mm -hmm. a parent um, observes that the child is hyperactive and, you know, just leaves the child there, mm -hmm. um, what about long-term consequences? Yeah, um, I mean, the research shows, Cheryl, that once a child is hyperactive or impulsive, especially if they have a diagnosable disorder, uh, what can happen is that, one, it affects their learning. Because if they're always getting up, running outside, running under the table, running out of class, or probably when they're home, not completing their homework, fidgeting, moving around, uh, probably sulking, they're not getting the tasks done. They're not getting the academics completed. So that could push them back a little bit. Now, 
nothing necessarily is wrong with their brain in terms of a learning challenge or anything like that, but just not being familiar with the information, not going it over because of the interruptions that the impulsivity and the hyperactivity can bring with it, it really put them at a disadvantage. And of course, we know once you're in school, you're building on specific topics and knowledge. And if there's deficits, it really puts you in a position where you move up to another class and uh, you will be at a disadvantage because you didn't really capture the information. And even going forward to what we notice is that, and this is actually in research, that a hyperactive or impulsive person is more likely to engage in fights and aggression. Mm -hmm. And even in adulthood, I mean, we're talking about early childhood, but even in adulthood, you can find that person who did not receive the intervention right. is more, more, more than likely, if they're, in a, uh, they're driving, uh, they're more likely to be in vehicular accidents. They're more likely to get out of their cars on the highway and jump out and probably try to attack another driver who give them a bad drive. Mm -hmm. and, so there's a whole host of challenges. Of course, there's a positive too. With some hyperactive or impulsive children, once they are given the support, can be remarkable individuals. These are the individuals who are into the sports and the, the, the masonry and the plumbing and the hands-on stuff and the marketing and the sales and the moving around. Mm -hmm. And these are not the kids you'll put at a desk to sit down and write. Right, I understand that. So let's, as we are talking about that, let's bring the parents in because I think to see success, parent mm -hmm. and teacher must work together. Yeah. So how can this happen? Because you know, as we stated before, parents can be in denial. Mm -hmm. So how can we get them to work along and you know provide strategies and interventions that would assist the child? Yeah, um, it's really important that parents and teachers see the need to work collaboratively. Working together will indeed help this impulsive or, or hyperactive child. So attending meetings at school, for example, there might be a parent-teacher meeting we really want to encourage your parents to attend these meetings, hear what is going on with your child, as well as even uh, teachers finding out from the parent exactly what's going on at home. So there's this kind of collaboration, not just the teacher is in school and the parent, and the child is somewhere in the middle in isolation. Okay, so coming from your way, um, school support services, what support can we get what network intervent you know what network networks are mm -hmm. available for parents to assist yes um once a child is showing some kind of impulsivity or hyperactivity and is disrupting their daily function that child can actually be referred to student support services mm -hmm. so there's something called a multidisciplinary team mdt where a case referred can come from either a parent or from the school and once it comes, we look at the case, we make assessments, we try to identify based on notes that will come from the school, what is going on with this child, we'll interview the child, we'll interview the parent, look at the surroundings. So as to really help this child to be as productive as possible. So there are support available for our parents and for our teachers as well, and for our students. Is this as early as early childhood? As early as early childhood, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, as we continue, can you give us, um, so you talked about school support services, uh, there, there is um, information there, do you have leaflets or you have material that we can hand out to parents, mm -hmm. do you have that available? A number of the units actually do have it, as well as persons can actually go on the ministry website mm -hmm. and there are a number of information available to a parent and to teachers as well. We take a break and be right back. We are here with Alex discussing 
hyperactivity and impulsivity in early childhood students. So before the break, we discussed um, how we, 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 just, we were talking about teachers and parents. I want to focus a little bit more on teachers. Mm -hmm. How can teachers understand the difference and be able to observe and make a, um, uh, what, a, a clear demarcation between hyperactivity and impulsivity? Right. So, um, Cheryl, what I will say is that uh, oftentimes when you have a child who is hyperactive or impulsive and, and causing some disturbance in the classroom and that child needs to be referred, for example, to student support services, we encourage the teacher to collect as much documentation as possible. And then when the child is referred, that documentation comes to the district office so that the MDT or the multidisciplinary team can sit and look at it. Now, in many instances, we don't recommend that the teacher try to figure out what's hyperactive, what's impulsive. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where the clinical or the school psychologist will do their screening, their assessments. And uh, uh, while it's true that a four-year-old, a three-year-old may not get a diagnosis, for example, of ADHD, there will be some reservations with regards to giving that diagnosis. There will be intervention that can happen at that level to support that child understand. So tell us how parents and caregivers can strike a balance between the discipline for impulsivity and um, hyperactivity. Yeah, I mean, holding a hyperactive or impulsive child accountable, uh, probably even more so than the typical functioning child is necessary, because this is a child that may easily forget or uh, doesn't follow through or probably leaves halfway through their homework and runs outside to play or chase after the dog or the cat or something like that. So it's really important to have a, a, a strong discipline regime. Now, of course, it's not going to be strict to the point where it's going to harm the child, obviously, but it is helping the child to regulate. So it is as though the parent now becomes that external brain mm -hmm. helping that child. Okay, this is what you do now. This is what you do next. This is what you do after. So in that sense, um, helping that child by means of disciplining or training that child is really, really critical for a parent to do. Really holding them accountable and creating that prosthetic environment. That environment that has the stickers, the reward charts, the rules and the consequences. That's how you, you discipline or you train or you modify that child's behavior. And of course, as you mentioned before, parents and teachers. Parents and teachers. Hand in hand. That's correct. That's correct. So from observation, um, I realize that we have a lot more children entering early childhood centers displaying this hyperactivity, impulsivity disorder. Mm -hmm. What does the research say about it? Well, I mean, the research out there, it's, it's varied, but this is what I've seen recently. I've noticed that uh, behavior modification, the researchers are looking to see how behavior modification is actually assisting children that age group, four, three-year-olds, approaching five. Because what happens sometimes is that the younger the child is, it might be a little difficult for them to sustain. Remember, they are growing. So it's a little difficult for them to sustain the, uh, what they will have learned in therapy. Mm -hmm. So, for example, after a year in some research, it's showing that once behavioral modification is not consistent, the child forgets. So once you have that break. So the research is really showing there needs to be some consistency over the course of the child's education into even teenagehood and even up. Uh, also, too, there's some research uh, being done on uh, uh, psychopharmacological drugs. That's basically medication. Mm -hmm. Because some of our kids, they really could be a harm to themselves or to others because of the impulsivity or the hyperactivity. They get up, they run outside, probably chasing through the, 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 the classroom door, uh, sometimes going towards the gate. And the, the, the security have to keep the gate locked and closed at all times. They may try to climb the fence. So some of the research are actually looking at not just behavior modification, but whether or not uh, drugs, medication um, should be given, how effective it is uh, for a child that particular age group. 
I, as you talked about that, our teachers, the teachers under my care, they normally talk about those children as being runners mm -hmm. because they just leave and dart out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. And um, parents, parents, we ask parents to continually work along with us so that that kind of behavior can be not just fixed because of, like you mm -hmm. said, it's it, but just managed. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk a little bit about. We talked about the research. How does um, resources for teachers, let's see, how can teachers use whatever resources they have in school to assist these children? Yeah, uh, Cheryl, many times teachers, they, they have the resources. And first and foremost, the resources actually their knowledge, their skill, their ability, their uh, opportunity to show warmth and care to these children. And with some additional training, uh, possibly even if we come in, let's say the behavioral specialist or the school psychologist or the clinical psychologist comes in, can actually show them how to use what they already have and probably just some additional stuff so that they can actually help that child or even the class on a whole to mm -hmm. modify their behaviors. So many times punch cards, these are things you can just print, mm -hmm. um, ticks you just draw with a crayon or a marker, you write something nice and send it home on um, a, a page for the parents saying, you know, today your son did exceptionally well, mm -hmm. he was able to sit quietly, pay attention, focus, and just sending that home, a parent reads that, and the parent now buys into the idea that, okay, probably I'm doing something good here, let me continue doing yes. it, and that support is offered at the home front as well. So based on what you said before, do you have any, at least one success story with an early childhood child that you can tell us about? Yeah, there's actually um, a, a student who um, I'm working with actually right now where that child is beginning to settle. He, he has not settled completely as yet, but he's beginning to settle. The, the duration in which he is sitting is increasing. Not a whole lot, but it's increasing because we're working on, for example, time activities. If you sit for at least five minutes, this is what you can get at the end. And not just saying you have to sit there, but making sure that that child has the necessary materials mm -hmm. so that when he sits there, he doesn't have to get up and then go and get other materials and on his way to maybe the, the section that has the crayon, he sees maybe a butterfly outside and he's gone. Mm -hmm. So making certain that he has only materials available and having timed activities. So actually, currently, we're working on that, and we're already seeing improvements. So it's important that you have a clock, to, and you put that clock there so that the child will see, okay, when that this long hand reaches there, right. so and so, so that is an, and a that, factor that we need to take That's correct, that's correct. And for kids who may have a little difficulty in understanding time, mm -hmm. the teacher could actually get a clock. It doesn't have to be a working one, but just the hands, and you can say to the child, okay, Right now, I'm going to put the hands here. When it reach here, mm -hmm. you have to stop the activity. So let's say that represents 15 minutes. You as a teacher, every five minutes, you just move the hand and say, okay, the hand just move. You have at least yes. 10 more minutes. So the child will recognize, okay, I have to increase in this activity or speed up on this activity. So, Alec, can, uh, can technology be used? to assist in the um, modification of the behavior? Uh, yeah, definitely technology could be used. Of course, uh, there are some hyperactive and impulsive children. It is critical that the technology be chosen accurately. I know there are some games out there. Sometimes what happens is that the child becomes more fixated on playing the game because it's instant reward as opposed to actually learning how to control or how to modify their behavior. So technology used sparingly, uh, but nothing is wrong with screen um, or anything like that. Thank you, Alec, for this interesting conversation on the Parenting Podcast, Talking ECCP. Thank mm -hmm. you. For more information, you can email us at ecce at moe.gov.tt or you can reach us on our social media platform. You can check us for any episode, future episodes of the Parenting Podcast. Thank you. Thank you.